Ella, Blythe, and Daisy, here we are. You've put in a lot of work over the last couple of years, and even more so before that, learning about your faith. And today, you're ready to stand in the presence of your brothers and sisters in Christ in this place who are celebrating with you your confession and confirming of the faith that you were baptized into. But before we get there, I want to kind of rewind things back a little bit and ask a few questions. Do you know how to start a fire without matches? Do you know how to grow your own vegetables? Do you know how to swim? Do you know how to read a paper map or use a compass? Do you know how to drive a car? Now, some of these you probably know how to do. Maybe some of them you still don't know how to do. Paper maps and compasses, for example, are not really in vogue anymore now that you have a GPS built into your phone. I still remember going on family vacations with a giant atlas and getting lost somewhere in the back roads of Indiana. Fortunately, I don't have to do that. But at one point, something that's true that runs through all of those things is that we didn't know how to do them. I'll use my son Henry as as an example, who he's sick, so he's not here today. But he just turned one year old a few weeks ago. He doesn't know how to do any of those things I just asked you about. He's still working on walking without holding on to something to stabilize himself and working on speaking intelligent words, intelligible words in the English language. He's got a few down, but he's got a lot to go. So dear Confirmands, it is Confirmation Sunday, and you were once in the same position as my son Henry, just like everyone gathered here. Your parents probably have some lovely and adorable memories, and maybe even some pictures of that time in your life. But the truth is, if today you are still suffering from the same lacks as a one-year-old, It would no longer be so cute and adorable as somebody bumbling around. Instead, we would think something has gone terribly wrong. Because as human beings, as we develop and grow, we learn to do new things. And how is it that we learn? We learn because someone teaches us. Just like there's an appropriate time to teach the basic things of life, your life of faith is no different. We don't know how to do anything. We can't speak the words when we become new Christians. And we are very far from doing the things the words describe. Such is our fate when we become baptized believers. It's almost as if we start over. We enter into a new life. So how are we able to come to know how to do these things, like speak in actual words, walk and swim, drive and read a map, grow food, and all the other things that make up the work of living, someone guides us. Dear Confirmands, we are here today to celebrate a step in the guidance of your faith. Through the work of your parents teaching you to pray, to read the scriptures, to come to church, driving you to class each week for the past two years, and helping you do your homework, you now know enough of the faith that you were baptized into to stand in front of us and say it out loud in your own words. Well, in church, pastors are supposed to preach about the Bible, and so we're going to do that again for you today. Our first reading for today shows this truth of learning and being guided in the faith in a beautiful and moving story. It tells us of a more knowledgeable and informed mature Christian teaching someone new in the faith. Philip, one of Jesus' disciples, and a new believer in God who isn't quite yet familiar with what the Bible talks about. And just like each of you, when you were first baptized as infants, you didn't know much about the faith either. And part of our confession of faith, it makes sense, because holy baptism is not something you do. In the Lutheran Church, we baptize you as infants because it is a work of God that He does in mercy. He claims you as His own. He washes you clean of your sins, and He puts His name on you and says, You are mine. In order to receive that gift, we don't need to be able to speak or know anything about the faith. But yet God gives it, 
and he has much more joy in store for us from then on. So in this account in Acts 8, God sets up a scenario for his disciple to bring these continued good gifts to a new believer in Jesus. So first, God sends Philip to a specific place. The text says, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down to Jerusalem to Gaza. And some of you who have struggled with sharing your faith might be wondering, man, it would be nice if God would give me such specific instructions. Go down three houses to your left in your neighborhood and speak with Joe. But what we get from this text is we understand that the circumstances in which we interact with those who don't believe or are new to the faith are orchestrated not by us, but by, by God. So he goes where he's told, and he sees this Ethiopian eunuch reading the scroll of Isaiah, which would have been hard to come by at that time, so this is quite a precious thing. And Philip is instructed by the Spirit to go over and speak with him, join his chariot. So Philip runs to him, and he asks the Ethiopian eunuch, Do you understand what you're reading? To which the eunuch responds, How can I unless someone guides me. So it is with all who come into the faith. Your instruction in the faith is part of what binds you with all of those gathered here today. They too have received such instruction so that like Philip does for the Ethiopian eunuch, you and they can understand what it is you are reading when you open your Bibles. So what is it that we need to understand about our faith when we read the Bible? I won't put them on the spot, but I know they know the answer to this question. They shared it with their friends and family last night. But Acts 8 beautifully crystallizes this truth down to a really understandable and short phrase. It informs us that the passage that the Ethiopian eunuch is reading is from the book of Isaiah, and it's a prophecy. And he asks for understanding about who the prophecy is about. And here's what he was reading. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shears is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. So as a new Christian, as a somebody who's reading the Bible and doesn't really understand what's being said there, he says, who's this talking about? Is the prophet talking about himself or someone else? And as Lutherans, we believe and confess that the Scriptures are all about Jesus. He fulfills all of God's Word to us. To understand what the Scriptures are saying, not only in Isaiah but elsewhere, we must first know of what the text describes as the good news about Jesus. So this is precisely where Philip begins. The text says, Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this Scripture... He told him the good news about Jesus. Dear confirmands, this is the task that your parents, your pastors, and fellow Christians have been engaging in with each of you since you were born and baptized into the faith. We have been opening our mouths to tell you about the good news of Jesus. So today is a day of joy for you and for us because shortly you're going to stand up and publicly confirm this faith, that you believe, that you have heard and understood the good news about Jesus, to which our response as your brothers and sisters in Christ, your parents and all your family who love you is one of joy. Now, we see this joy present in the text between the interaction of Philip and this Ethiopian man as well, because when he hears this news, he's overjoyed, so much so that as soon as he sees some water anywhere, he says, is there any reason I can't be baptized right now? No, let's go. And so Philip baptizes him. And not only does his urgency to be baptized display his joy at what he has heard, in this good news about Jesus. But it says that after Philip is carried away and he doesn't see him anymore, the text says he went on his way rejoicing. Now this makes complete sense if we pause and think about it. What is the most precious gift we can give to someone we love as a Christian? 
It's the sharing of the good news about Jesus. The gift of faith being given through the Holy Spirit, through God's Word, because it changes literally everything about our lives. That is why he goes away rejoicing. That is why today we're celebrating and we're expressing our joy in this confession of faith, in this giving of this gift. Now, one of the infamous statements that people will say about confirmation is that it's like graduation from church school. Now, it's true that you won't be required to come at Wednesdays at 7 o'clock anymore, although you're welcome to if you'd like. But your journey of joy in Jesus is just beginning. It's not ending. It's only even more being invited into receiving more gifts and a closer relationship with God that is beginning today. There's so much more to learn about how much God loves you, about how He is going to be with you in the midst of the sufferings and struggles of your life, how much He's going to bless you in all the ways that He can. There's so much to learn that you could dedicate your entire life to the study of God's Word and still not have finished by the time He calls you to be with Himself. So to that end, here at Ascension, we're going to continue to provide you with the opportunity to learn in Bible class on a weekly basis, and we're going to pray for and equip your homes to continue to be places where you pray and read the scriptures together and live out your faith in the joy of the good news of Jesus. So my encouragement to you is to continue to come to church Continue to seek to learn and read your scriptures. Come to the altar today and each week forward with joy, knowing full well this gift of God, uh, the loving sacrifice of his son's body and blood on the cross, was indeed given for you, for the forgiveness of your sins, for you to have life. So just as your parents, your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, and I as your pastor will continue to pray for you, teach you, and love you. And we do this all because of the good news about Jesus. So it's only fitting, I've been talking a lot about the good news of Jesus, that I leave you with a proclamation of that good news. Philip started with the scripture from Isaiah chapter 53, and so will I. To answer the eunuch's question, that was about Jesus. Jesus willingly and silently submitted to the death that you deserved so that you would not have to suffer it. He took all of your sins, those that you've committed in the past and those you will commit in the future, into his own body on the cross and instead in exchange gave you his perfect righteousness, his relationship with God as a beloved child. He bore your pain, your sorrows, and sins in his very body. When you were baptized, he washed you clean of your sin and claimed you as his beloved child in Jesus. So today, Ella and Blythe and Daisy, we rejoice with you as you proclaim your faith in the good news about Jesus, that God loves you, that he forgives you of your sins, and that he has made you his own child and that you will be with him forever in his kingdom. Praise God that you are growing in knowledge and now stand to confirm your faith in him. In the name of Jesus, amen.